Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining class this morning. So while since you saw me, you saw me on Friday, Kung. <laughs> okay. I know that's been a long time now. Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. Uh, welcome to class. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone like to lead us in prayer? All right, I'll pray. Thank you, Harrison. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless your name. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the opportunity you got to study your word. Thank you, God, for the gathering for this fellowship of God. We thank you that the words we are about to hear will speak life to us and will bear fruit in us, that we will take these words and go forth to God and preach the gospel and bring expansion to your kingdom. Mm -hmm. we, we, we sanctify our ears and we pray, Lord, that you help us to open our minds to receive. Mm -hmm. Let the words of God that we hear be words from the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. Let, as we listen to God to your word this morning, this afternoon, this evening, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will help us, not just to be hearers of your word, but also to be doers of your word. Thank you, Father, because we know at the end of this class, we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' much less name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, today we're going to be looking at the most beautiful chapter, Romans 8. Uh, it's one of my favorite chapters. Any of your favorite chapters? Anyone? Your favorite chapter is Romans 8? Anyone? Romans 8 verse 1. Okay, it's your favorite verse, okay. Okay, so it's my favorite chapters, one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible. Okay, so we'll be looking at Romans chapter 8. Before we look at Romans chapter 8, uh, we'll just recap a few things. Okay, so in Romans chapter 5 and 6, Apostle Paul is introducing us uh, to this whole truth of identification uh, in Romans chapter 5, he presents to us how every human being is identified through Adam. Uh, through Adam's sin came and also came condemnation and judgment and everything that leads to uh, death. And we know that Adam was a type of the real man who is to come, that is Jesus Christ, uh, through whom, you know, Paul says, we have received the free gift of God. We have received the gift of grace, righteousness, salvation, eternal life, uh, uh, the right standing in grace, uh, the ability to rule and reign. We've received all this from uh, Jesus Christ, who he calls as the second Adam or the last uh, Adam. Okay, and in Romans six, uh, you know, we we see that Paul uh, takes us uh, into a deeper identification of uh, who we are. Where he says, you know, we've been identified with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation, or seated at the right hand of the Father. And says all of this uh, has meaning for us in the sense that these various steps you know, has actually set us free from various aspects of the things that Adam put us into uh, bondage or the various aspects of the things that Adam put us in bondage to. So he says being crucified, you know, uh, we are set free from the power of sin. Uh, being buried, he says, we are set free from the old way of life that is Adam's life. Being resurrected, you know, we are given a brand new life of God. We have the Zoe life, the very life of God. Being raised up with Christ, you know, took us out of that uh, place of influence of the darkness of this age. And being seated up with Christ um, actually put us into a place of dominion and authority. Uh, whereas, you know, Adam put us into subjection to sin, uh, to sickness and to death. Okay, so the truth of identification, uh, you know, is a complete reversal of what Adam put us 
uh, in the fall and you know what Jesus purchased for us on the cross. So the main theme of Romans chapter 6 is that as believers we can live free from uh, sin. Now in Romans chapter 7 you know Paul uh, uh, states a problem. Uh, he says that there is weakness in the flesh uh, and we know that the word flesh in the Bible is used in different contexts uh, but in this context is talking about the evil desires of the body and the soul. So body and soul, soul means our mind, our will in our emotions. And then in, uh, in Romans chapter 7, you know, Paul is talking of himself uh, as a man under the law where he does not have the life of God. Uh, he has every desire to keep the law and to please God, but he finds there is a law in his members, in his body, in his soul, in his mind that's controlling him. So even though he wants to do what is good and what is pleasing to God and fulfill the law of God, he finds himself powerless uh, in the struggle of sin. And hence he calls it as the law of sin that is controlling him in his uh, body. Okay, And uh, this is a state of every person uh, who is unsaved and not living under God. And in verse 25 of Romans 7, you know, Paul presents uh, the answer to us. And what is the answer? He says the answer is Jesus Christ. And then he brings us to uh, Romans chapter 8. Uh, and we know that Romans chapter 8 is a very beautiful chapter for us as believers. Uh, it's telling us, you know, how we can live in the provision of the identification. Okay, yes, we identify with Christ. We are in Christ. But when we are identified with Christ, God has made a provision for us and how we can live in that provision. So what is the provision he's made for us? You know, it's uh, he's, uh, you know, we are, uh, uh, you know, we have the gift of grace. We have the gift of righteousness, the salvation, eternal life. We have the ability to rule and reign. Uh, we have the right standing with grace uh, of grace with God. And because of that standing, you know, we learned all the benefits of our standing in grace. Uh, we also have the ability to rule in, and reign over every powers of uh, darkness. We have peace with God. We are no longer enemies with God. We are children of God. We are sons uh, and we are heirs, uh, uh, you know, of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. So all this is, um, you know, uh, is what we have um, uh, received you know, as uh, our uh, provision that, that God has given us as a provision because of our identification uh, uh, in Christ or with um, Christ. And so, you know, in this chapter 8, he's telling us how we can live in the provision of uh, identification. So when we look at identification in Romans uh, 5 and 6, uh, we also see God's provision that uh, God has provided for us. And God is saying, you know, I have done all this for you and I've provided all this uh, for you through Jesus Christ. Uh, but how do we live that experientially? How do we walk in this experientially? And Romans chapter 8, Paul uh, tells us how we can walk in this experientially. Okay, so that's a, a brief recap and a background to Romans chapter 8. So we'll begin with Romans chapter 8. So can somebody please read verses 1 to verse 11, please? Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, for the law of the spirit of life to Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to this flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to, the, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. 
for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of his righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Thank you, Asha. So in Romans chapter 7, you know, Paul has been talking about uh, life without Christ and life under the law. Now, Paul in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is changing his focus to speaking about a uh, life in Christ. And um, uh, he says in Romans chapter 7, he says, he tells us his difficulty, you know, that he wants to do the good things. Uh, and, you know, he's not able to do it. Um, and so he's uh, talking here about how, uh, you know, we can experientially walk in the provision that God has made based on our identification uh, in Christ uh, Jesus. Okay, so he says that he's finding it difficult to do the good things he wants to do. So how does he make this shift? And he's talking about this in Romans chapter Eight. In verse 1, he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay. Now, in these verses, Paul is talking uh, to those who are in Christ Jesus, which means he's talking to believers. Um, so he says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, there is no accusation, there is no charge that is brought against them or can be held up against uh, them or against us as believers. We are totally free from every condemnation. Uh, now, Paul is, um, you know, he, he knows what it, it means to feel condemned because under the law, uh, you know, Paul felt com completely uh, condemned. How do we know this? We get this sense when we read uh, Romans chapter 7, where he says, you know, oh, wretched man that I am. Okay, so he feels condemned under the law. But, you know, when he starts this whole chapter where he's shifting his focus uh, from uh, the law to focusing on Jesus Christ and uh, uh, life in the spirit or life in Christ Jesus, he's saying there is no condemnation. And for him, uh, you know, this this word, there is no condemnation means a, a great uh, a, a great, uh, you know, it has great meaning. It makes a world of a difference for him uh, because, you know, under the law, he's feeling so condemned because he says, oh, wretched man that I am. You know, I want to do what is good, but I'm not able to do what I want to do. I do not do what I don't want to do. I do it. And, uh, you know, I'm not able to keep the law. I'm not able to please God. And um, so he's, Paul says, you know, the, the law highlights uh, uh, sin but leaves the person feeling condemned. Okay, the, the law shows us that we have sinned, we have broken God's standard, it highlights sin, but it leaves the person feeling condemned. But you know, Paul is saying, in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Amen? Okay, but he says, when we come in Christ, you know, we are completely free from these feelings of uh, condemnations. Uh, life in Christ sets us free from all condemnation, uh, so as believers, we should not live under any guilt or condemnation. We are free from it. Uh, if a believer is, you know, feeling condemned all the time, uh, you know, they have actually not understood uh, their life in Christ. You know, we can hear sometimes pr believers pray, oh God, I'm such a sinner, uh, you know, I've uh, done this, I have done that, uh, you know, uh, before I came to know you, I was this, I was that, and, you know, all of that. Yes, that's the truth. But, you know, we moved on from there. We focus on who we are in Christ now. We focus on our blessings. Uh, so, you know, if believers are constantly feeling condemned all the time, they've actually in one way not understood their life in Christ. And they're still living their life under the Old Testament, under the law mentality. Uh, 
you know, under sin mentality. Um, and that is why they're always feeling, you know, judged, condemned or accused. But when we understand who we are in Christ, when we understand our life in Christ, uh, we know that there is no condemnation. And he says these uh, uh, people who are in Christ, he says that they do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And who don't have this condemnation? Those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now to walk, you know, Paul often uses this phrase. Uh, we see this phrase he uses in Galatians. He says, walk in the spirit. Uh, we also read this in Corinthians where he says, walk in the faith. Um, you know, and he's basically saying how we need uh, to live our lives or how we need to conduct our lives. Uh, we do not walk or we do not live or we do not conduct ourselves according to the flesh. Uh, you know, um, in accordance to means, you know, uh, uh, in alignment with or in subjection to uh, the flesh. We do not live like this. But he says, you know, we are not dictated or controlled by the flesh, but we are under the influence um, of the spirit. So he says we are not, uh, you know, in accordance means we are not in alignment or we are not in subjection uh, to the flesh. We are not dictated or controlled by the flesh. We are not under the influence of the flesh. Uh, this is not how we live. Um, but how do we live? He says this is how we live habitually. This is how life happens to uh, for us. Uh, we live in accordance, which means we live in alignment. We live in subjection. We live under the influence or we live under the direction or the leading of the spirit. Okay. So when we are in Christ, you know, uh, we are no longer in condemnation, but we are also not to be walking, um, uh, you know, in accordance to the flesh, but accordance to the uh, spirit. That means, in accordance means, you know, we are, um, we are in alignment, we are in subjection, we are under the influence, the direction, or the leading of the Holy uh, spirit. So in, in Galatians, when he's talking about walk in the spirit, you know, it means he's saying live in the spirit or live in alignment and subjection to and under the influence and the direction of the Holy Spirit, which is again, you know, Galatians chapter 5, which is a very beautiful chapter where he lists out the deeds of the flesh and the, the deeds of the, uh, the fruit of the spirit. And in Ephesians 5, you know, he also talks about living uh, the spirit-filled life. The same thing he talks about in Colossians chapter 3. So all these, you know, uh, uh, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, all these are like parallel chapters. And uh, he's reiterating, the Paul, Apostle Paul is reiterating the same truth uh, to different audiences. And he's bringing out different facets of the life of the uh, spirit. So we can study all of these references uh, in parallel. Uh, but here in Romans chapter 8, uh, he's saying walk according uh, to the spirit. Okay. In verse 2, uh, he says what happens when we walk according to the spirit. In verse 2, he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay. So he says the law of the spirit of life, and he's talking also of the law of the spirit uh, of sin and death. So he's talking about the law of the spirit of life and the law of uh, sin and death. And these are terms that he's already used earlier. Uh, we read in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 23, uh, he says, But I see another law uh, in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So here he's referring to the law of sin uh, in his members, which means members means in his body. And then he talks about the law of sin, uh, which is the influence that controls or the, you know, the dominion of sin. And um, uh, so the word law repeats uh, in, in uh, verse 25. Again, he's, he's spoken about it in verse 23 of chapter 7. He also mentions it in uh, verse 25 of chapter 7, where he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
so then with the mind i myself uh, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So again, we see here he's presenting the law of, uh, uh, you know, of God. He's presenting the law of sin. Um, and so, you know, he's saying that, uh, you know, our flesh is subject to the law of sin. In Romans chapter 7, verse 25, uh, he's saying that, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the flesh is subject to the law of sin, which means it is subject to the control, to the dominion, to the influence of um, sin. And the natural evil desires of uh, his soul and body is controlled by uh, sin. And Romans chapter 8, verse 2, he's here talking about, you know, the law of the spirit of life. He's already spoken about the law of sin. Uh, we see that in chapter 7, law of death. We've also seen that in chapter 7. Now he's talking of the law of the spirit of life. And when he's mentioning the law of the spirit of life, he's not referring to the Old Testament law. But uh, when he's talking about the law of the spirit of life, it means the control, the dominion, the influence of the spirit of life. So the word law here basically means the control, the dominion, the influence of the spirit of life and notice uh, the holy spirit here is referred to as the spirit of life so what paul is saying here uh, is very intentional you know he's saying that the law of sin produces death but the law of the spirit of life is giving me life can we say an amen to that you know the law of sin produces death in us death in our uh, in the members of our body, but the law of the spirit of life, that is the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in us, indwelling in us, who infills us, is giving me life, is giving you uh, life. So the control, the dominion, the influence uh, of the spirit of life, you know, sets me free from the control, the dominion, the influence of sin, uh, what sin is producing death in my body. So sin is producing death, both spiritual and physical death. Um, you know, also it's producing, I said death, uh, remember the last class I said, death also refers to uh, decay, uh, to corruption, you know, body is decaying, it's being corrupted. Uh, and then we experience physical death and ultimately spiritual uh, death. But the spirit of life, you know, is setting us free from the control, the dominion, the influence of sin and death. Amen. Okay. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, uh, you know, Paul is actually presenting to us uh, the answer to the struggle that he has presented in Romans chapter 7, where he says, you know, I'm controlled by the law of sin in my body you know there's nothing i can do about it i want to do the good i'm not able to do it what i don't want to do that i do you know and uh, you know who can help me and then he presents the answer here as well as he presented in romans chapter 7 verse 25 the end the last verse in that chapter where he says the answer is jesus christ here he presents to us again he says you know the answer is what is the answer paul says is the holy spirit the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit that sets me free from the control of sin and death that sin has been producing in me. The Holy Spirit sets us free. Okay, so for all of us, uh, so for all of us who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Uh, so all of us who are in Christ were able to walk not in accordance to the flesh, but in accordance to the uh, spirit and the Holy Spirit uh, liberates us. The Holy Spirit uh, sets us free uh, completely from the control of sin uh, and the result of sin, which is death. Okay, we we'll move on to verse 3 where he says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak to the flesh, God did by sending his son, his own son, in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, now Paul is saying that the law couldn't help him uh, to overcome the flesh. The law told him what is right and what is wrong, but the law did not give him the power to overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. So saying what the law could not do, in that it was weak to the flesh, 
you know, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, an account of sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, this phrase, in the likeness of sinful flesh, okay, uh, you know, uh, God became man, Jesus, his body, you know, um, uh, could have been because he came in the body he, be he became like one of us he became like you and me his body you know could have been subjected to fleshly desires just like you and i have been you know but we know that he did not submit to any of that uh, but he came in that same kind of body that you and i have that could be uh, subjected to the desires or the evil desires of the flesh or the fleshly desires but we know that the Son of God did not submit to any of the fleshly desires. He never sinned. And uh, he never sinned, but he condemned the sin in the flesh. Very powerful. You know, uh, what Paul is presenting to us is so powerful. He's saying he did not sin, but he condemned sin in his flesh. You know, it means Jesus subdued. He overcame. He deprived sin of its power. Uh, in his own body, Jesus deprived sin of its power and sin had no power over him. Uh, and, you know, in his body, he broke the power of sin. So in his body, he broke the power of sin and he gained the victory over sin and death. And, you know, he shares the victory with us. So we also have the victory over sin and death. So powerful. And so beautifully, uh, Paul presents this for us. And in verse 4, he says that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Again, very beautifully presented, he says that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay. Jesus did the work. He completed the work. He condemned sin in his flesh. Uh, he broke the power of sin in his flesh. He won the victory. He gave us the victory. He shares his victory with us. He did the work. But who is walking in that victory? It's you and I who is walking in that uh, victory. Okay. So he condemns sin in his body so that we will be able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. So each one of us, you know, we can... Uh, fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Why? Because Jesus has won the victory on the cross. He has condemned sin in his body. So how do we fulfill the righteous requirements of uh, the law? Uh, you know, he says, we do not, Paul says, we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So Paul is saying, this is God's answer to our problem. What is God's answer to our problem? Uh, when we walk according to the uh, spirit and not to, according to the flesh, we will fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. And this is God's answer to us for our problem that, you know, he, um, uh, you know, condemns sin in his body. And, uh, you know, because he condemns sin in his body, we are able to keep the righteous requirements of the law. The righteous requirements of the law can be fulfilled in us. So Paul is saying this is God's answer to our problem. So when we walk according to the spirit, we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. So Paul's struggle in Romans 7 uh, is finding its solution in Romans chapter 8. The answer is, you know, walk according to the spirit because the spirit is the one that sets us uh, free from the law of sin and uh, death. But how do we walk according to the spirit? Uh, that is what, you know, Paul, Apostle Paul is teaching us here in this chapter in the further uh, verses, okay? So to walk according to the spirit, he says, we need to be spiritually minded. We cannot be or we should not be carnally minded. We need to be spiritually minded. And it places before that, you know, we uh, before us, it places a, a choice that we make. So we are constantly uh, uh, in a choice. You know, Paul says, you know, uh, there's always a constant a war that is happening between the flesh and the spirit. So we need to choose 
whether we want to be uh, spiritually minded or we need we want to be carnally minded but if you want to walk according to the spirit if we want to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law then we have to walk according to the spirit and to walk according to the spirit we need to be spiritually minded we cannot be carnal uh, minded so in verse 5 he says for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit the things of the spirit okay so he says set their minds on the things of the flesh which means you know a person who is seeking after or a person who's pursuing after the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit which means they are pursuing they are seeking uh, after the things of the spirit okay so here is a key on uh, you know how do i live and walk according to the spirit or how do i live my life in subjection or in alignment to the holy spirit paul says we need to set our mind set our mind means you know we need to our seeking our thinking our pursuing our, uh, our affections our desires should all be set on the things of the spirit and we consciously need to make the shift from setting our minds on the things of the flesh to setting our minds on the things of the spirit uh, when we set our minds on the things of the spirit, we will be finding ourselves walking in the uh, spirit. And we read in, uh, you know, when we look at Romans chapter 12, you know, we, we see that Paul comes back to the same point where he says, do not be conformed to this world, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So our minds uh, need to be changed to, to think uh, spiritually to think spiritual things so um uh so practically you know how do we uh, set our minds on the things of the spirit um you know one way that we can do uh, to set our minds on the things of the spirit is we need to think aligned to the word of god every day of our life in every aspect of our life in every choice uh that we make a uh, day in and uh day out so for example you know um for example if we are going to work you know we are working in an office you know people go to work for different reasons you know uh, but the basic uh, reason is you know we go to earn money so that we can take care of our uh, basic necessities uh, but people also work uh, because they want to grow professionally they want to enhance their skills which is very good uh, but, you know, a carnally minded person, when a carnally minded person goes to work, he's basically thinking how he can earn more money, whether he's doing business or, you know, whether he's working in, the, in a company, how he can earn money, how he can overtake others, how he can rise up other faster than others, how he can you know, pull down others so that he can climb up the ladder of uh, success. But a spiritually minded person, you know, things, uh, you know, I want to glorify God in my work, in, you know, the way I'm working, the way I'm spending my time, what time I come in, what time I go, what I do during my office hours, everything. I want to be excellent. I want to honor God. I want to glorify God in my work. Um, and, you know, I want to see how I can influence, uh, you know, uh, the kingdom of God in my uh, in, in my workplace because, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, the spiritual dimension of the kingdom that we're living in now. And the kingdom of God is in us and the kingdom of God in and through us infiltrates, it permeates uh, uh, through, you know, every area of our lives. So uh, the, the kingdom authority, the kingdom power that that God has given to us, it, it, um, it infiltrates, it uh, permeates, it influences our, en our environment. You know, we don't have to be under uh, situations. We don't have to be overwhelmed, but we stand above it because, you know, God has given us that kingdom authority, that power to decree, to speak, uh, uh, to see his kingdom come 
know his will be done on earth at this in heaven in every area area of our life whether it's in our marriage in our in our homes in our finances in our in our job uh, so you know a, a, a spiritually minded person um, is beginning to see how he can uh, you know do something of or bring something of meaning and fruit uh, for god's kingdom in and through his uh, uh, job and yes he's doing the same mundane routine activities but he's being spiritually minded he's saying i want to glorify god in my work i want to fulfill god's purpose uh, in what i'm doing i want to bring kingdom uh, values kingdom principles kingdom lifestyles uh, kingdom culture in this place that i'm living i want to take up this mountain of business or this uh, this mountain of education or uh, you know the mountain of family wherever god has placed me i want to bring in god's kingdom and i want god's kingdom to just prevail and to pervade to every aspect of this sphere or this area or this mountain in my uh, life so we see that you know the spiritually minded person is basically seeking thinking pursuing and setting his affections and desires on the things of uh, the spirit uh, in his routine everyday uh, work of life and because he's doing this you know he's going to be living or he's going to be walking in accordance to the spirit so at his workplace uh, you know um, you know as uh, he sees people doing different things manipulating uh, fighting with each other pushing down others uh, you know gossiping backbiting uh, he's not hassled about you know how to you know climb up the ladder of success to get to the top uh, he knows God is his promoter, God is his rewarder. Yes, he's going to work hard. He's going to be excellent in what he's doing. Uh, he wants God to bless his work. Of course, he wants to climb up the ladder of success. But in his mind, uh, he's not outdoing the other person. He doesn't want to put down the other person. He doesn't want to climb over them uh, to reach up to the uh, top. And whatever he has in mind, he's doing his work. He wants it to glorify uh, God. So this is just one basic example uh, that you know how we see a carnally minded person and how we see a spiritual minded person thinks and um, uh, and lives um, you know uh, so we see that you know uh, uh, the person who is uh, spiritually minded you know uh, he's living according to the spirit in his workplace he's not worried about what people are doing behind his back he's not retaliating but he's just walking in love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control exhibiting the fruit of the spirit why because he set his mind about and he's walking in the spirit uh, so you know to walk according to the spirit we have to be spiritual minded in every area of our lives okay and we come to verse uh, 6 he says for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace so here paul is basically making a contrast here uh this is what he's telling a believer saying if you are carnally minded what is the outcome the outcome is death so here he's not talking to a person under the law but he's talking to a believer so he's saying he's telling the believer here that if you are carnally minded what is the outcome the outcome is death but if you're spiritually minded what is the outcome the outcome is life and uh, peace and verse 7 he says because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be so Paul is saying that a believer if you are carnally minded that, that then there is going to be death you know uh, that working in you that working in the mem in the members of your body uh, he says that you are uh, you are in enmity with god he says then you are not uh, subject to the law of god okay and he says nor can you be so he's talking about the carnal minded what is um, uh, the result of a carnal mind person he's in enmity against god uh, you know, death is going to be working in the members of his body. And he says that, you know, uh, the person is not subject to the law of God. Okay. And verse 8, he says, so then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And these are very strong words uh, that he uses. 
you know, a parallel scripture uh, we read in uh, James chapter 4, verse 4. So can uh, all of us please turn in our Bibles to James chapter 4, verse 4, please. Can somebody read James chapter 4, verse 4? Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Thank you, Asha. So here, you know, um, he's saying that those who are fr make, uh, are friends with the world, or those who live their lives, you know, pleasing the desires of the world or the carnal nature, he says they are enmity with uh, God okay um, so the same thing here you know he says if you are walking in a carnal mind you are an enemy the enemy of God you cannot do what is right uh, you cannot be subject to the law of God you cannot please God uh, which does not mean that God is going to uh, disown us or neither does it mean that God is going to say, I don't like you, I don't, or I don't love you anymore. No, because in Christ, you know, God loves us, He's merciful, uh, He loves us, He accepts us, His love for us will never change. Uh, we are always His sons and His daughters, you know, uh, we are heirs of His kingdom, uh, you know, but yes, sin you know, hurts or uh, grieves the very heart of God, grieves the Holy Spirit that is um, uh, living in us. But, you know, it says, but if we live a life pleasing to the carnal nature, then that is working in us. We are enemies of God. Uh, you know, we are going one way where God is asking us to go the other way. So we are, you know, constantly, we are, we are in two different directions. And when we are going our own way and God wants us to go in a different way, we know that we cannot please God uh, through our life. Now, uh, we can ask or we can think, you know, why is it when, you know, God has made all these wonderful provisions that we looked at in chapter 5 and 6 and chapter 7, the wonderful provisions that God has made for us as uh, because of the truth of our identification or because of our identification in Christ, when God has made all of these provisions, which I also mentioned in the beginning of this class, why is it that so many believers are, uh, you know, still living such defeated lives why is there still death at work in them why is it that they are going in an opposite direction this is talking about believers why is they going why is it they're going in an opposite direction when god wants them to go in a different direction uh, why is it that they're living lives that does not please god and the answer for all of this is for those believers who are you know not living the truth of their identification we don't see the provision of god the uh, the uh, provision of that god has made because of their identity in christ we see them going in a different direction uh, we see that that is still working in their in in the members of their body we see that they're not living their lives to please god uh, why is it that happens is because the answer is that believers are still carnally minded okay they are setting their minds on pleasing and satisfying the evil desires of the flesh, of the body and soul, and that is being carnally minded, okay? And this is actually more important for them than setting their minds on the things of their spirit. They're enjoying it you know, feeding their carnal nature. They're enjoying pleasing and satisfying the, the, the evil desires of the flesh, uh, you know, then setting their minds on the things of the spirit. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, what are we thinking, desiring and pursuing? Where is our thoughts? Where is our desires? Where is what we are pursuing? Are we thinking, desiring and pursuing the things of the flesh? We, then we are carnally minded or are we thinking, pursuing and desiring uh, the things of the spirit when we do you know, we are uh, 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 we are spirit minded. We are setting our minds on things of the spirit. Okay, so if the believer's life is thinking, desiring, and constantly pursuing the things of the spirit. Paul says the believer will enjoy a life of peace. So if you're saying 
or oh, well, there's no peace in my life, then you need to ask you, uh, this question. You know, what are you thinking, desiring, and pursuing? Is it thinking, desiring, pursuing uh, the things of the flesh, the evil desires, the carnal nature, or the things of the uh, spirit? Okay, so if you are pursuing the things of the spirit, he says the believer will enjoy a life of peace. He will be friends of God and he will please God. But if my thinking, my desiring and my pursuing is how I can desire the evil desires of my flesh as a believer, then I will just see death at work in me. Okay, there will be brokenness, pain, depression, uh, fear, anxiety, uh, every kind of sickness, pain, you know, that's just because we are so focused on seeking, desiring and pleasing the evil desires of our uh, flesh. So, so important for us, you know, to move, to make that shift from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. And we need to get our fellow believers from making that transition, from moving, making that shift from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. Otherwise, you know, all that God has done for us on the cross, all the wonderful promises and blessings that he's given to us, you know, everything will just be in this book. You know, it'll just be in our Bible. And, you know, we won't be able to experience uh, uh, anything or, you know, and all of these things will just be like words to us. It will just be like, oh, I can't do it. You know, sin is dead in my body. I don't believe that. And we we'll come to that state. So we need to pursue uh, to be spiritually minded and not carnal minded. Verse 9, he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is, he, he is not his. So Paul is telling the believers, you are not to be living according to the flesh, but the spirit. Why? Because the spirit of God dwells in us. We know that when we are born again, you know, the spirit comes and dwells in us for ever. Okay, because the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you have no excuse to live in the flesh, but to live in the spirit. And he says you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And this is the life of the believer. The life of a believer is that he is not in the flesh. He is in the spirit. In the spirit means living out of the spirit. You know, uh, a nice analogy that we can use uh, is that of a fish living in water. Now, a fish living in water, its life is in the water. You, I'm sure you've all seen when a fish, you know, when the, uh, the net is cast and the fish are gathered, you know, and it's pulled out of the water. What happens to the fish? It's basically wriggling and struggling to to breathe, to survive, and it, it cannot die in the environment that we are living in, you know, because its environment is the, it's the water. Its life comes from the water. Likewise, you know, we believers need to live in the spirit. We need to be in that spirit. That is the environment that gives us uh, uh, life. That is the environment that can help us uh, to live, uh, you know, not carnally minded, but spiritually minded. So how is this possible? You know, um, how can uh, a believer live spiritually minded? How can he live in the spirit? It's possible because of the spirit of God who's indwelling in me, the spirit of God who lives in me. And because the spirit of God, because the 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 the, the, uh, the spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit, is called the light, uh, the spirit of life. Because the spirit of life is living in me, my life is coming from the Holy Spirit who is living in me. Because He's the Spirit of life, He gives life. So our uh, our life, our existence, our uh, our strength. Uh, is drawn out from the Spirit of God that is dwelling in me. Just like, you know, the existence of a fish is drawn out of the water that it is uh, living in. So my life is coming from uh, the Spirit of God, who is also the Spirit of life, who is the giver of life. Okay. Verse 10 says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the, 
but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So in verse 7, he says, the spirit of Christ is in you. Verse 10, he says, Christ is in you. And here we see uh, a title for the Holy Spirit. He said, he's calling it as a spirit of Christ. Okay, the spirit of Christ. It means all who are uh, in Christ uh, is uh, all who are, uh, all who, sorry, it means all who Christ is, uh, you know, is the Holy Spirit is in you and is in me. All who are in Christ, uh, you know, we have the Holy Spirit who is in us and the Holy Spirit uh, brings uh, Jesus to you and me. He brings us life, but he also brings uh, Jesus to uh, you and me, okay? So we'll stop here because it's time up. Anyone has any questions? Anyone has any questions? Uh, we'll continue with verse 10 onwards um, on Friday, but uh, anyone has any questions now? Okay, see you all on, on uh, Friday then. Thank you all for joining class. Um, have a blessed day. And uh, you know, please uh, read Romans chapter 8. You know, take hold of what um, the provisions God has made for us uh, based on our truth of our, ide our identification and what the Holy Spirit can do in us and speak the life uh, of uh, God into your life, into your circumstances, into your situation. Okay, thank you everyone.